Hi everyone, this is Dr. J. And in this video, I'm going to talk just very briefly about a couple of outlier cases that you might come across uh, while you're doing seismic refraction surveys. These cases are here on the board. Uh, in one case, you have a dipping refractor layer. Sorry, there's a lot going on, but the top plot is basically our two layer problem, but with a dipping refractor uh, layer or boundary. And then time distance plot is on the lower part of the graph. If we look here on the right hand side of the whiteboard, here we have a case where we have a step discontinuity. So we have velocity one in the top layer, but there is a step to a deeper depth as you go um, across the section. And then of course V2 down below. Both of these cases might show up uh, in the case of a dipping refractor. Um, you know, that could be various reasons due to topography or whatever. In the case of this step discontinuity, that is often going to happen when you have a fault. So for example, if you have a normal fault, um, which would be the most common kind of fault that we would see in this area, you might see a faster layer, V2, right next to a slower layer, V1, and that's because that fault is offset and that's brought down material that is velocity V1 uh, right next to, to be right next to velocity material with velocity V2. Okay, so that's how you might see these cases uh, in, in real life. Um, and I just want to show you and go over very quickly what we do in the seismic refraction survey to be able to account for that. So first of all, focusing on the dipping layer, this is why we actually shoot both forward and reverse shots. And the forward and reverse shot is uh, when we have the source at one end and then at the other end of the shot spread. So what we see, again, this is our time distance plot here on the bottom. So if we take the forward shot, that's the case where we're normally used to looking at. Uh, again, we have our initial direct wave, that's one over velocity V1. And then we have the crossover distance uh, one over, in this case, uh, some velocity, which is related to the actual true velocity V2, uh, but it's not exactly V2 because of this angle. It changes the travel time, it changes the distance that's traveled, and so we get an, an apparent velocity, which we'll call VD. Um, and then of course that has some slope that we'll measure. When we take the reverse shot, so we shoot this way in the forward direction, let's say we shoot back this way in the second direction, it's going to look uh, like this in the second case. And I'll just highlight that in blue so you can see it a little better. Um, again, we'll have velocity one over, or slope one over V1 uh, for this first, um, region uh, before the crossover distance. And when we cross to V2, there'll be a slightly different slope um, and we'll see this kind of offset pattern. Uh, and we'll be able to use this, these two apparent velocities now in these, both of these directions to calculate what the approximate value of V2 is. And it's just taking the average of those of VU and VD. So this is why we take both forward and reverse shots in case we have a dipping layer, we'll be able to see that. And by the way, we also take forward and reverse shots because the total travel times for a given offset distance, um, and the offset distance is again, the distance between the source and the very first geophone. So if we put the source right next to the end geophones, the source and receiver distances should be the same whether we're taking the forward shot or the reverse shot. And if they're not the same, then that is giving us a clue that either we picked the arrival times poorly or maybe one of the geophones wasn't working or something like that. So we can also use those forward and reverse shots to distinguish um, errors or problems with the data. So we've taken the forward and reverse shots and now we can determine if we have a dipping bed, we can still determine approximately what that uh, velocity V2 layer is. So again, we have a step discontinuity between layer one and layer two. And I'm going to again show you the time distance plot down here on the bottom. In this case, what we, this is why we take um, an off-end shot. So we've talked about this, but basically we separate the source from the geophone array by some distance. And when we do that, if we see, instead of like here where we see a change in the slope, here we are seeing an actual vertical change in the, uh, in the refracted line. And that is an indication that we've got this step, that we're going, we're refracting, but we're actually, we have horizontally um, uh, adjacent, I guess, horizontally adjacent higher and lower velocities. Now, what would we see in the case where, there, where there's just a flat layer? Well, we would just see with, with, the, um, with the offset shot, I should say. That would be a horizontal change. So we, this line would be here, but it would move horizontally. 
if we have a uh, just a, a straight two layer problem. Um, but with this step discontinuity, it moves vertically. So instead of being a distance shift, right? Because so the offset is moving further away from the geophones. So we would expect we just have the same exact line, but it would just be shifted to farther away. And instead, what we see is that it's also shifted vertically. And that's again, because it's intersecting this V2 uh, layer at a different place than, you, than it would if it was just two horizontal layers. Okay, so those are two kind of end member cases that we might come across when we're doing seismic refraction. It's important to take those off, offline shots as well as the forward and reverse shots so that we can work out uh, the data from the data um, if any of these might be the case. Again, if you're going out in the field, you won't necessarily know what's the case ahead of time. You might suspect. If you suspect, you certainly want to do this. Um, but either way, with those five shots that we've talked about before, off of one end, at one end, in the middle, at the other end, off the other end, We'll basically be able to cover all of these cases and when we plot up the data from each one of those shots we'll be able to uh, do this type of analysis and determine if we have any of those cases okay so with that i'm going to wrap up this video and i'll see you next time